Okay, welcome back to the final talk for this afternoon. Um, this is uh, by Marcio Gamero, who's here at Rutgers, and he'll be talking about computing dynamics via combinatorial methods. Marcio. Mm, okay. Um, and of course, they start cutting grass just now. So, <laughs> or it's an airplane, I don't know. Some, some big noise just started outside. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm going to risk the, having the same problem as Bill, and I'll try to present from my iPad while you're also connected with my computer. Hopefully, I will have better luck. <laughs> I will see. <laughs> so, yeah, so let me first give like a very brief overview. So um, we, we, most of the things or I guess all of the things we're going to, I, I'm going to be discussing here, they have already been at least uh, mentioned by Constantine and, and Bill. Um, but the, in my talk, the main goal of this talk will be to illustrate the software that we have to perform these computations. So I'm going to try to discuss some of the, of the at least some details of the algorithms and, and the methods, but uh, also illustrate the software and how to how to use the software. So hopefully, if you are so if you are interested in actually using the software and doing the computations, I hope the talk will be, will be useful and hopefully it will also be useful in case you are not necessarily interested in using the, the software yourself, but maybe the ideas will be will be useful. Um, so hopefully I managed to, to get the right balance between these things. Uh, and I will organize the, soft, the, the talk, loosely organize the talk around the, the software practice that I'm going to be describing. I think, that, I think it's a natural way to organize it. And uh, uh, so let's see. So then uh, the, just um, the software package that we're going to be discussing today is, uh, that is this, the first two package, Chomp and PyChomp, that they are actually more or less incarnation of one. So it's kind of like two packages, but they are kind of doing in some sense, most of, most of them, I mean, big part of them do, do the same thing. So like both of them are for computational homology. Um, so the, the, the main difference is that the first one, Chomp is just a C++ library and it has um, lots of functionality. So we can compute homology, mapping homology, calling index for maps and, and lots of things. And the second one, PyChomp, it's a Python interface to some of the functionality of Chomp. So in PyChomp, you have this Python interface, but you, you cannot access all the functionality of Chomp. So this is something that we're working on to, to bind them together more, more closely. So then the, that will be able to access all the functionality through Python. And also this um, connection matrix computation that it's um, that you use to compute the calling index for flow. This will be described in this is available in PyCharm. Um, so I'm also going to dis the, describe, discuss the Colin Morris graph database, which is the this package that you use to compute um, Colin Morris graph uh, for maps. And I'll very briefly mention DSGRN, which is um, the package to study dynamics of networks. And we're not, I think the SGN is not of direct interest to, to, to people in this, in, this, uh, in this workshop, but I'm gonna use um, an example kind of derived from the SGN to, to discuss how to compute the connection matrix and how to compute the polling index for false. Right, so that's the, the very, very brief overview of what we're going to discuss. And um, so, I will probably repeat lots of things that Bill and, and, and Constantine already discussed, hopefully not too much, but, um, but I think it's good to review a few things. So, so let's start with just a little bit of the very base theory. So we again have a dynamical system for now. It's a, let's talk first about, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna say, I said, I'm gonna talk about this for software package. I'm not gonna talk then on this order. So I'm gonna start discussing, um, I guess in some sense, Conley Morris graph database, because in some sense, I'm going to start discussing uh, computing uh, things for a discrete dynamical system for a map, and then I'll discuss uh, homology, and then finally the HRN. So then let's start with a discrete dynamical system. So we have a map and then uh, we are interested in 
understanding invariant set. So a set is invariant if f of s equals s. And our goal is to understand the, the structure and the connections of invariant sets, right? As we have been discussing here all day today. And the, the tools are going to be used is going to be combinatorial methods and algebraic topology as, as was mentioned before. So, so I'm going to be in some sense very, I guess very concrete because I'm going to be discussing the specific settings in which the software package that I'm going to be discussing uh, does, the, does the, the computation. So, The first, the first, so we start with um, a grid decomposition of our space S, X. So we are interested in understanding the dynamic of our map in the space X. So we get a grid decomposition of this space. And at this level, the grid decomposition could be any kind of grid decomposition. And then we have um, this multi valued map on this grid decomposition. And this, um, this multi valued map has. Um, as Bill discussed before, it is supposed to um, approximate your dynamics, right? So you have your grid. So like here, the grid is this cubic grid. Then you pick a grid element and you compute the image of this grid element by the map. That's the, the image. And then you want to cover, now you would look on this side. So now you want to cover the image of the, of the actual map by your grid elements. And this cover is the image under this multivalued map of of this uh, grid element here, right? So the image of this under this map is the set of green box, right? And this is, um, we can see this multi-valued map also as a directed graph, right? Or also we mentioned, we, we refer to it sometimes as state transition graph, right? So you do this for every grid element. So then you have this multi-valued map that represents your dynamics as this die graph, right? And here, if um, when you are computing this multivalued map, if you if you do it in a rigorous way, in such a way that you are guaranteeing that you are always enclosing the, the true image of the map, then you get rigorous results. If you do numerics or if you just sample points, then, then, um, then you don't have rigorous results. But here I'm assuming that somehow we have, for now we have this multivalued map, right? And in, um, in the computation that we're going to be describing, we're going to be doing this for maps, we're going to be doing this on a cubical complex. Um, and then it's already being, being mentioned. So we, we compute the strongly connect components of this directed graph. And the non-trivial strongly connect components of this graph are the things that, that we're interested in. And this gives us the Morse graph, right? So here, if um, if this is our graph, and if this thing, these things in highlighted are the strongly connect, the non-trivial strongly connect components, then they will give us this Morse um, this Morse graph. So like this is the this is Morse set, and this is Morse set. Right. So this also have been uh, described before. So, and, and then, so as it, as it was discussed before, so we have linear, linear time, there, is, there are linear time algorithms to compute the strongly connect component. So this part of the computations, they are, it's fast, it's linear. Li there is a linear algorithm. What is usually um, the expensive part is to uh, compute this multivalued map. And especially if you're in higher dimensions, then uh, if, if you want to get, um, a very fine grid, then it's hard to, I mean, it's it's um, it's impossible to get a, a very fine grid in higher dimension. And this this is the expensive part of the computation up to this point. Uh, and here in the in the Morse graph, so the vertices of the of the of the Morse graph, they represent the recurrent dynamics, right? So this is where in the in this uh, in this graph level you see recurrence. And the edges are, are uh, gradient-like dynamics, right? So these are the things that uh, you go from one recurrent component to another, right? So you decompose your dynamic into uh, recurrent dynamics and the gradient-like. Um, and one, 
one um, just one one remark is that we use a very memory efficient algorithm to do these computations, and this algorithm is by Sean Harker. Um, in this algorithm, we don't need to uh, load the whole graph into memory, so only parts of the graph are are so. We we compute this this directed graph as we as we go through the algorithm. Each part of this graph only only needs to be looked at once, and you only need to hold pieces of this graph into the memory at once. So you, even if you have a very really big um, directed graph, you may still be able to run the computations because you don't you don't even need to 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 be to to compute the whole thing into memory. Right? You can um, just compute the the graph as you go along. Right, so, and, and since it, there is a linear algorithm to compute this uh, strongly connected component, so this part of the, this part of the computations is that's the, the part that is very efficient and fast. Um, so how do we, how, how is, how this is, this is done in uh, this Collimars graph database in the software that does computation. So here, the software does this, for rectangle in our end, so you you always um, assume that your your dynamics is you're interested in a rectangular region in our end, and it uses this um, adaptive grid instead of get having a uniform grid in this rectangle, it uses a uniform grid using this what um, we call init mean max and limit scheme. This meaning this init is initial. Uh, initial grid, initial subdivision. So, so this value in it gives you how many how many initial subdivisions you have. So, you, if in it is zero, you get just the, the whole box initially. Otherwise, you one subdivision, two subdivisions. Uh, so, the mean is the minimum number of subdivisions that you are going to do during this uh, adaptive uh, scheme, and the maximum is the maximum number of subdivisions that you you may you may you may perform on a on a grid, and this limit is the is the is the limit on the number of uh, boxes that you are allowed to have in a, in a component uh, before you can. So you if you reach that limit, then you stop subdividing it, right? So you always guarantee to to at least do this mean number of subdivisions, but once you pass this mean number of subdivisions, you may stop subdividing if you reach this limit. Right? So if you don't reach this limit, you keep subdividing until you get to this max. So this is to make the, the computation more efficient. So like uh, this is, will be like, you're depending on the value of init, this will be your initial grid. So like, let's say if you choose an init of three, you get this initial grid. So then on this initial grid, we, we compute the strongly connect component, the composition of that initial grid. Then since you're only interested in the, since you are interested in, in finding the more sets, we're interested in, in, in the, the recurrent parts. So we throw away the parts that are not part of the non trivial strongly connect components. And then you subdivide each one of the recurrent components. And then you repeat this process at least this minimum number of subdivisions for each grid element. Uh, and you may subdivide, as I mentioned before, up to this maximum number of subdivision, but you will stop if you if you reach the limit uh, number of boxes after the mean number of subdivisions, right? So then you get some, uh, this kind of non-uniform subdivision. As you see here, uh, here in this particular computations, at the end, the more sets are just these green regions. And then all these gray regions are the things that were discarded during this adaptive method, right? So like this, uh, these bigger regions were discarded very quickly. In some other regions, we, you can kind of see, I hope that you refined it a lot, but uh, eventually you discard them as no recurrent. So this is, is one way to try to make this computation more efficient to hopefully be able to do it for higher dimensions. Uh, so this is, is um, somewhat more, more efficient than doing, um, than doing uh, a uniform grid on the whole space. Um, and then once you, do, once you have the Morris graph, we want to compute the, we want to compute the Cone index. So let me, um, quickly define the Cone index, and then um, and then we'll see some examples, and then later I'll discuss how we actually compute the Cone index. Right. 
uh, I guess we already seen what the cone index is, but let's um, just to, to describe how we compute it. Let me let me define it. So we we have this notion that uh, of an isolated neighborhood, which is just um, an, a compact set such that the invariant part of this set is in the interior of the set, right? So if you, take, if you have a compact set, if you find the invariant part of it, if it's in the interior, it's in, called an isolated neighborhood. Uh, where the invariant part is just the maximum invariant set in N. Um, and then if we have a pair of sets, P0, compact sets, P0 subset of P1, uh, if we denote by P this pair of sets, then we define this map from the quotient space P1, P0. Uh, and this map is defined to be just uh, this FP map is just F of X. If both X and F of X is in the set P1 minus P0, Otherwise, uh, it's just this point, um, this point uh, that is the, the, the equivalent class of P0. Right? And this uh, pair is called an index pair if two, thing, two conditions are satisfied. One is this FP is a continuous map. And um, if the closure of P, P1 take away P0 is an uh, isolated neighborhood, isolated neighborhood, right? So if you have the, an index pair, then you compute the cone index. So the, for maps, um, the associated cone index is the shift equivalent class uh, of the induced mapping homology. So you compute the, this, uh, the, the relative homology of the, 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 the homology of this uh, pointed space. If you want to take away P0 with this special point P0, and you compute the induced mapping homology FP. And then the shift equivalent class of this map is the is the cone index for maps, right? Now, how do we how do we get this index? So, so we need to find the index pair, and then we need to compute this um, compute this this map. Um, for a more set M, uh, the way we compute things, we get an index pair just by taking the set uh, f of M and f of M take away M, right? So this gives us an index pair. And here I'm abuse notation a little bit by M. I, I mean, um, sometimes I, I refer to M referring to the grids in the cell complex. And here when I when I compute this, so this is a set of grids in the cell complex, but here I'm thinking about the set represented by this, this grid. So you take the set in phase space represented by F of M and then F of M take away M. So this pair of sets, this gives us an index pair. So then once you have the more sets, then we can, um, from here, we immediately get the get index pairs to compute the cone index in this context, uh, right? And then to compute the cone index, we need to compute these homology groups and compute these maps in homology, and then um, look at the shift equivalent class of these maps. Um, but before. So before we talk about how we compute homology and, and, and mapping homology in maps in homology, let's um, let's um, first discuss why why do we want to compute the cone index and then look at some examples. Uh, the first the first thing that has already been mentioned before is that if the um, if the cone index is non-trivial, then the invariant set inside the set you want take away p zero is non-empty. Um, so then every time we get non-trivial cone index, you know there is some invariant set in there. Um, and also for this, in this particular, um, in this particular case, if you do the computations of homology over a field, then this uh, FP maps, these maps in homology are, are linear maps, they are matrices. And in this case, we represent them by the, the, the the invariant factors, the polynomials represent the invariant factors of the ratio canonical form. And then, so then the cone index will be represented by things like this. So where these polynomials represent the, the invariant factors of the rational canonical forms of these linear maps. And one, one result, another simple result is that if the cone index looks like this, the first component is x to the power t minus one, and then everything else is zero, then um, the more set M corresponding to this cone index can be decomposed into M distinct components, N1 up to NT, such that the 
original the underlying map f takes n i to n i plus one, where the last one is equal to first. So you have a so this is not saying that we have a periodic orbit, but it's saying that um, we have um, like this, uh, we call this a stable T cycle. So we have this cycle of sets where F takes one set to the next. Okay. Try to move this a bit. Um, so, and then, um, so we use, as I mentioned, Chomp is used to compute the Cohen index, and I'm going to discuss later how to how to uh, a bit of some details of how this is done. But let's first um, let's first look at some examples of how this um, of this right. Uh, so just um, in case somebody is interested in getting the software, so it's available on GitHub, and um, it's. Supposedly easy to install, assume you have your C++ compiler and all the dependencies installed, then you just need to type install the test age. So it's it's written in C++ with a Python interface. So then once it's installed, it's easy to use. Uh, and there are plenty of examples in the software package, including Jupyter Notebooks. So it's, um, and um, so we are working to make it uh, Easier, even easier to install, so you don't need a C++ compiler, so you just install with a pip install, but for now you need a compiler. So let's um, look at uh, a few examples. So once you install the software, you're gonna run it, it, it it's supposed to be run in, in Python, so you have a Python interface, so you just have to import the, the library. Um, then, the simplest way to run it is just run it here directly in Python. So you, you define your map. So here is just a less the map. So you just define your map in Python. Just uh, this is just a simple map that, uh, that Bill present the formula. So it's just a simple two dimensional map. So you define the values for your parameters. So this is the, the actual map. And then you need to define the map that takes rectangles, rectangles to take boxes to unit of boxes. So then for this, you just call this common in here. So this just uh, takes the original map F, that's the actual dynamical system and defines this, what we, we call a box map, which is a map that takes boxes, rectangles into union of rectangles. And there are several ways that this map can be computed. So if you, if you want to have rigorous results that are interval arithmetic libraries in Python, so then you can use interval arithmetic to evaluate this map then you get rigorous results. Otherwise, you can just um, get use faster faster methods to, to sample it, to, to compute it. So the default way is just to sample the corner points of, of your box. So you take our box, you compute, evaluate the map F at the corner points of your box, map that forward and use that to, to compute this box map. Right? So with that, you don't get rigorous results, but you don't, you don't get guaranteed results, but but in practice, you get um, seems to be accurate result. And then you just have to define your parameters here. So this is just the, the that minimal level subdivisions, the maximum level subdivisions that I mentioned. And here, this lower bounds and the upper bounds of the box where you want to do the computations, your phase space X. Um, and here, then you just uh, define this thing that you call model. And then once you have this model, then you can just um, uh, compute call this. Compute Conley Morse graph. And then you can ask it to plot the Morse graph in the Morse sense. And as you see, of course, this is a simple map in 2D, but this is, this is very fast for 17 seconds to do the computations, including the Conley index computation. And here, and here, that's what we get. So here you get uh, this is the Morse graph, this four more sets, and here are the, the actual corresponding Morse sense color coded. And here, as I mentioned before, so here the Conley index, so here the, the thing before these numbers zero, one, two, three are just the labels of the of the Morse graphs, Morse graph zero, one, two, three. And the things in um, this tuple here, they just represent the Conley index, as I mentioned before. And like in the first, uh, in this case here, we get x to the power of three minus one. So it means you have a stable three cycle. It means that this green, this light green, um, set here 
is a stable tree cycle. So we just with this computation, we don't know, we cannot we cannot say that there is a periodic orbit in here, but we, we can guarantee that uh, that um, the actual the map takes some set from this inside a set in here, inside a set here. So there is this stable tree cycle. Right. So then the Cohen index gives us guarantee that what we're seeing here is not just an artifact from the from the numerics or from the Zelda approximation. The, the invariant set here is non-empty and it's uh, we have this stable tree cycle. So now I'm just going to repeat the same computation just to illustrate one thing. And the only thing I'm going to change here is in this first computation, I just defined the minimum and the maximum number of subdivisions. I did not define the initial number of subdivisions. And by default, the initial number of subdivisions, the initial grid uh, is just the, the original box. So if you don't define the initial number of subdivisions, it is zero as the by default. So here in this other computation, I'm going to define this initial number of subdivisions to be four. So it means you start, instead of starting with uh, the original box, you start with uh, this two by two grid. Uh, you, you subdivide it four times. Uh, if you do that, you get um, the same kind of more sets, but you get slightly different Morse graphs. Right? And um, this is the reachability condition that um, that uh, Bill mentioned. So the thing is, when you do it like this, with um, starting with uh, without um, with zero as the initial number of subdivisions, so you, you do the first computations on this very coarse grid, and then on this very coarse grid. You, you find that there is a connection between three and two. And then once you do that, you only refine inside the more sets. You never refine outside of the more sets. So that um, connection that you found initially, it will be maintained until then. So you get this more set, saying that there seems to be a connection from here to here. In, in, the, in the, the Morse graph, that is, there is an edge from here to here and here to here. And here you get a more precise result. So it's saying that uh, there is an edge in the Morse graph from three to two, and then from two, you go to zero and one. Um, one important thing to mention here is that this is not wrong. The only thing is that this is more refined information right? because what the Morse graph is supposed to tell you when you see something like this is just that um, this is not telling you that there is a connection from three to one, it's just telling you that that it's impossible to have a connection going from the bottom to the top. So it's impossible to have a connection from one to two. So, in, so this Morse graph is correct, but this is more, more precise, more refined. Right? So if you want to actually get information about the actual connecting orbits between the sets, then you have to, to, to do additional um, computation, algebraic computation. Just with the Morse graph, you don't, you don't you cannot guarantee that there is a connection, right? But you can uh, you can play with this initial number of subdivisions. You can sometimes get a, a better, a more refined uh, Morse graph. Um, and um, also, just very quickly, is, is also possible if you want if you do, in case you, especially if you are in higher dimensions you you, do, you don't want to initially compute the, the, the calling index, you can compute just the Morse graph. If you just, instead of calling, just uh, compute um, compute calling Morse graph, if you just call compute Morse graph, then you just compute the Morse graph without compute the calling index. This will save you some time on the computation, especially in higher dimensions, if, uh, if the Morse sets are very complicated. And then just a very quickly, just mention that it's also, uh, if you have an OD, you, you can also, of course, easily do um, time tau map for an OD, right? So this is just a simple Vanderpool oscillator. You take the oscillator, you choose a time tau, and uh, you compute a time tau map using a simple Rangakuta, and then you do the computation, and then you get a um, Morse graph and a Morse set, doing exactly the same thing, right? So this is just a map. So we can we can do time tau map for ODs. Um, so I think I'm going much slower than I thought I would. So let me now, so I, I didn't describe how, how we compute homology. So let me briefly try to describe how, how Trump computes homology. So we, um, we have a start with a cell complex and I'm not going to define it precisely in all the details, but um, 
the cell complex can be very abstract cell complex. Uh, we, we need to have a notion of a, of, um, a set being a, a two, two cells, one being a face of each other. So we, we use this notation here, if one cell is a face of each other. And um, we can, of course, talk about the dimension of a cell. And then if we define properly the kind of cell complex we need, then we can, using that, we define a boundary. You can have a boundary operator that gives us the boundary of a cell. And then from there, we, we uh, we can we we have a chain complex and then the homology as the usual um, uh, cycle mod module boundaries, and then if you look at um, the the definition of homology, then you just need to compute the kernel and the image of a map, and this is kind of linear algebra, right? So if you're using field coefficients, then this is really truly linear algebra. If you're using integer coefficients, then you need to compute kernel and the image of a linear map using integer coefficient. So you can use the Smith normal form to do that if you want to directly compute this here. But um, directly doing the linear algebra on the boundary operator, it it's, can be very expensive, especially if you're using, for example, integer coefficients. So what we do is we first uh, try to reduce the size of the complex where we do the actual algebra computations. So we use this um, idea of Morse reduction. This is um, a reduction that, um, based on discrete Morse theory. So, so this is kind of the, the main idea of the algorithm of this Morse reduction is essentially here. It's, the idea is very simple. So you just, um, um, if you have a pair, like a T prime is, is a face of T and the boundary of, of, uh, of, the, of T is just, um, just one single element. So if you have one, one cell with a single element on its boundary, then you can remove that pair. If you, if you don't have that, then you can remove the lowest dimensional cell that has a zero boundary. So like, for example, a vertex, you can always remove a vertex. And then every time you, if you remove this, then you mark this uh, key as a critical cell. And then you repeat this process until you, eliminate as much of the cells in the neural complex as you want. And then what you, what you get at the end is that uh, the homology of the critical cells, the ones that you're removing this step, they will give us the homology of X. Right, so this is a, this is a very simple um, to describe algorithm and, and then you can prove that this gives us the, the right homology. So just to illustrate, here's a, here's a simple computation. So let's say you want to compute homology of this, uh, of this object in here. So initially here, there is no cell here that has a single element as the boundary. So then we remove, a, we find a critical cell. Any vertex would be a critical cell. So here we pick this, this vertex. So let's mark it as a critical cell and remove it. Now that this cell is removed, then now this edge has a single element on its boundary and the same for this edge. So this, this edge and this vertex is a pair that we can remove the same for this. So you can remove these two guys. And then you can repeat this process when you get to here. Now we are here and we have a two dimensional cell that has a single edge on its boundary. So then this is another pair you can remove. So now we can remove this two dimensional cell and this edge and you get to here. If you repeat this um, several times at the end, you're gonna get to this um, trivial complex that only have these two critical cells, the, the vertex and this edge. And then in this case, you can, the homology, you can just read the number of critical cells. You have one critical cell in dimension one, one critical cell in dimension zero, then the homology will be uh, one and one in dimension zero and one. And that's what we should have because here we're gonna have one connect component. So one in dimension zero, one, one, one whole, one cycle, one in dimension one, right? So if you use Z2 coefficient, you can express this as Z2 for K equals zero one or, or as this vector one, one, zero. Right, so this is the this is the Morse reduction algorithm. So when when we finish with the Morse reduction, if you don't get a trivial complex like this that you can just read the number of cells, uh, then you may still need to do the linear algebra and compute um, um, the image and the kernel of your operator uses Smith normal form if you're using integer coefficients. But then you're going to do that on a much more on a smaller uh, cell complex on a reduced cell complex just on the on the cell complex given by the critical cells. Right. So this is the algorithm that is implemented in CHOM. And then, um, 
again, so this is where you can find find Chomp. Um, and so the main idea of Chomp is is uh, should be used as a library. So there are lots of functionalities in Chomp that are uh, that are that are available in this as a C plus plus library. But there is no at the moment, at least, there is no like um, interface program for the user to use that. So the user needs to write a little interface code to do that. And there are, and and also the same ideas using this um, um, Morse reduction can be used to compute um, induced mapping homology, which is what you use to compute the cone index. So there are some examples in how to use this um, this uh, C plus this chomp package as a library. Some example how to do that. And one thing that we want to do is to integrate this more with the other parts that are in Chomp and put the Python interface to it so it'll be easier to use. So this is one thing that we, we, we plan to do. And just as, as an illustration of, um, I mean, just very quickly. So you, let's say if you have just a, a cubicle set, so one way to, to represent the cubicle set in the, this data structure that Chomp understands is just this, you just make a data file with this, this list of, of things. Each one of these tuples represents a, a cube. So like zero, zero is just, so this is the lower left corner of your cube. So you think of, you have a collection of um, unit cubes and here you just need to enter the lower left corner of the of the, each one of the cubes. So this collection of cubes um, is your cubicle complex. And then you just need to call, uh, there's this chomp cubicle. There's just one example uh, program that uh, will take this file and compute the, compute the homology and you give you the betting numbers which are this um, the dimension of the of your of your homology group, so like one one zero, and here would be one zero zero. So this is a trivial homology, so just one one single block of, of cubes. Right. So like this chomp uh, cubicle is one one example of um, of programs that is provided as a way to to understand how to use the library. So if you want to use the library to compute. Uh, homology of more, more complex set, you can see, look at this um, chomp cubicle uh, source code and see how it's used. Um, and then very briefly, let me, PyChomp is, again, as I mentioned before, is just, um, it's just a Python interface for chomp with a few additional things. Um, and then, um, so the GitHub repository for PyChomp is, uh, is this. There is a secondary GitHub repository, uh, which is this, and they are they have the same the same software. And the idea is the reason we have the second one is just because uh, we wanted I wanted to make it be installed with a pip install. So I I made in this repository I I made all the modifications needed to be able to install with a pip install. So you don't need to to have a C plus plus compiler or anything to install this. So if you just install pip install by chomp two. And I call it's called PyChomp two just because there is an old PyChomp um, in, in PyPI. Um, so if you install PyChomp two with this command, then you you get the latest uh, tagged version on this repository. Right. And in this PyChomp, uh, we have code to compute the connection matrix, which is what you use to compute the calling index for flows. So and then. Just a, a quick example, if you if you want to use so PyChomp is much more user friendly because you have this Python interface and you have ways to, to do several computations. For example, a very simple example, if you want to compute the homology of a simplicial complex, uh, you just after you install it, you just import it in Python. Then you define your collection of simplices just as a list of simplices. Again, here each simplex is just a Represent as a list, right? So just a zero, one, two are the vertices, and so on. So you have a, a two simplex, several two simplex, and a, and a zero simplex in here. So you can have any list of simplex in here. This will be our simplicial complex. And then um, then you just call this command to make a simplicial complex. And then once you have the simplicial complex, uh, this will give you the homology. And then the homology, this is what we call the homology complex. So this is the complex that you get after you do the Morse reduction. So you, you take this collection of simplices, this, this makes a simplicial complex. This applies Morse reduction and gives you this reduced complex. 
And then once you have this reduced complex after applying Morris reduction, all you need to do is count the number of cells in each dimension. So the Betty numbers, you just call this, uh, this homology complex, this count function just counts the number of cells of each dimension. Right? So this always reduces the, the complex, like in this example, then you just have to count the number of um, cells in this critical cells in this reduced complex. And then in this example, so then you can just, uh, the dimension of the complex, and then you can, if you want to count the number of cells, and then Betty numbers, which is just the count of, of cells in this reduced complex, this gives you the Betty numbers, two, zero, one. I guess I should have had a picture of this simplicial complex, but this is a simplicial complex with two components, no cycles, and one, uh, one thing in uh, dimension two. Right, so it's it's um, very easy to use PyCharm to, to do computations. One one thing that PyCharm does not have is um, nice interface to compute to compute um, other 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 types of homology. So if, if you want to compute um, homology of a cubical complex where some of the cubes are top dimension and some of them are lower dimensions, lower dimensional, then you don't have a you don't have a nice interface like this. So these are things that we are still working on, but we're planning to do that in the, in the future. And um, so do I have what, 10 more minutes? 10 minutes. Okay. So let me very briefly uh, talk about DSGRN. I, so DSGRN is, is, um, is the software used to, to um, compute dynamics for gen, uh, for gen, uh, regulatory networks. I don't think it's directly of interest in here, but as I mentioned before, I want you to mention it because I, I want you at least um, mention um, connection matrix that you use to compute the calling index for flows. And I'm gonna do an example that use DSGRN. So again, DSGRN is available on GitHub. You can also install with this. Uh, and is used to compute the dynamics of regulatory networks. Um, and um, I'm not going to try to describe what DSGN does, but the idea is um, if you have, um, you have a network and then if you have your, the nodes on your network, you can have two kinds of interactions between the nodes. The node Y can um, activate node X or it can repress node X. So the more Y you have, more X you, you produce. And here's the opposite. And then um, we model this in the SGR and we don't assume that we have an OD model to model this, the, the dynamics of the system, but we just model this just by um, the, the decay rate or the, 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 the rate of change of X is given by this kind of expression. So you have this natural decay rate and then here, if Y is activating X, so we're just saying that if Y is small, then it contributes with a small value L. If Y is large, it contributes with a large value L plus Delta. So this just tells us that uh, the more Y you have, the more X, the higher will be the, the, the rate of production of X. And here, so Y increase the production of X and here Y increase the, the, decrease the production of X. Now, all we, need to, all we want to do here is um, we want you to check. So what the SGN does is we want to see if the rate of change of X, the, the rate of production of X is positive or negative. And this, in this very simple case, since this, uh, this is the interaction between them, you just have to look at the sign of this function. If this, if this whole thing here is positive, then the rate of, the, then X is increasing. If it's negative, X is decreasing. And if you have more complicated interactions, then you just have combination of these functions here. And what the SGN does is um, it just, we just analyze the sign of this uh, interaction function that we get um, on the nodes arriving X. And we, we kind of um, analyze the, the signs of this interaction function depending on these parameters here. So, and then we, we get a parameter decomposition where for each set of parameters, uh, for each region of parameters in this parameter decomposition. So we, we get the decomposition of the whole parameter space in each one of these regions. We can say if, um, if we, we have the, exactly the sign of this interaction function, if they're positive or negative. So then in other words, you can, we can then 
uh, decide if the flow is pointing left or right or down or up. And this, and where uh, this, we look at things at this threshold level, right? So if you look at the, for each variable, we look at the threshold data and we see what happens when you're at data. If you cross from below data to, to above data, whether you, you move, you go to the left or to the right or to, to the bottom or to the top. So then you get this, uh, the cell, the composition, this cubicle complex is just uh, where these things are just defined by these thresholds. And the signs of this, um, of this, um, of these uh, functions are what tells us if we're moving right or left. So this is our multivalued map. So once you have the multivalued map, now, now you, you are in the same, the same business as before. So now you have a, you have a complex and you have a multivalued map. So you can, um, you can talk about uh, compute the strongly connect components and talk about more sense. Okay. So, and here just a, this for this network, so it is, you get this multivalue map, so then you can compute the more sets. In this case, the more sets will give you this two strongly connect components. Um, so this is the regular DSGN, but here we cannot, with this cell complex, we cannot compute the calling index because we don't have enough, um, enough cells in here to be able to, to define, to compute the calling index, to be able to define what you need, we need this, um, a transversality model. So what you do is we get um, we create a blow up complex, and then so what um, um, so what you do is each one of these cells, the the vertices and the edges, they get blown up on, on a top dimensional cell. So you get this extended blow up complex, and then we extend them from the from the signs of the vector from, from the signs of the of the Kind of the vector field in this in this cell complex, you can define this uh, the multivalued map in this blow up complex. And here, uh, so we compute um, what we call a transversality model. So the idea is here is is not going to be exactly actually this complex, but we can we are actually working on it. Um, and Everton is is um, is constructing. Um, a different cell complex in such a way that that, that cell complex that's, an, that's close to this blow up complex will give you a transversality model for a class of ODs. And then once you have a, a transversality model, then we can compute, um, we can compute the cone index. So, so the computation that we do without going to details how to do is so we have this refined cell complex and we have this multivalued map that tells us how to map from cell to cell. And here, I guess for the sake of uh, what you're doing, you can assume that this, um, the, the flow is transverse uh, when you cross these boundaries. Okay. So once you have this, then we can do, uh, we can compute the strongly connect components and, and compute the, the Conley index. And the, the connection matrix, what, um, what it gives us, and, and the reason I wanted to present this example is this particular example is probably maybe not uh, of interest here, but um, this is the is the only part that is specific to, to the SGRN. So the computation of this uh, cell complex and, and this um, multivalued map in this cell complex, this construction is specific to the SGRN. But um, if you have such a construction of this um, transversality model for an OD, and with some with some um, cell complex, then the rest of the computation, the computation of the connection matrix and, and the calling index, that will work exactly the same as as I'm going to to discuss now. Okay. So the idea of what the connection matrix is, so we want to so the connection matrix tells us how the in, how the calling indexes of the more sets relate and how. So how do we how do we define it? How do we compute it? So the idea is we just um, take the the, origin, the full complex, compute the strongly connect components, and here in the strongly connect components we get all the all the all the strongly connected components, including the trivial ones, the ones that there is only one vertex, <clears throat> and this uh, with that we can define a graded complex. And then once you have this graded complex, we can apply the Morse reduction, but now just using the rule that we are not, <coughs> sorry, that we're not allowed to, 
to to have pairs those pairs that we that we are going to eliminate that are on different components <clears throat> and once you apply Morse reduction then uh, the resulting boundary matrix that we get that's what the, the connection matrix is mm. and the connection matrix here uh, is what gives us how the this information about how the cone index relate and from the connection matrix we can also do directly get the cone index for the flow right the cone index we just have to count the cells of each dimension in this reduced complex in the connection matrix Again, the same way we do, we compute um, homology in chomp, in Python, right? So, um, and so here I just want to show you in case um, how how this is computed in, in Python. So here, in Python, so you you just um, have your cell complex, and you have your multi-valued map, and here this should work for uh, a general more general cell complex than this um, kind of cubicle complex. And you can define a multi-valued map in some other way. And then you can just um, just call this common to compute this, this uh, graded complex. And then once you get the graded complex, you just call this, this function in this vibration that's the, the graded complex. This gives you the connection matrix. And then from the connection matrix, again, you just have to count. So this common count here just counts the number of cells of each dimension. This gives you the cone indices, right? So then you get the, then you get the cone indices. Um, and here, these are the cone indices for these three more sets. And here, just one final example where we are just printing the connection matrix. So this is um, uh, for this, so here, well, the network is slightly different, and it's a for this network for a given parameter value, we get this cell complex and this uh, multi-valued map, and then you get this more set, and then here's the connection matrix data. So then the connection matrix here is just uh, just telling you how what are the boundaries of cells in each one of the dimensions. So for the one dimension of cells, so if you look at the more set six, which is uh, here, just saying that the, the boundary of this is the, is the cell three and zero, three and zero, and so on. And for each dimension, it tells you what is the, what is the boundary, uh, how, how the, what's the boundary of the, of the, the boundary matrix in this, um, for each dimension in this, uh, for the Mars, for the coin, this is in each dimension. Right, and this You're is kind of out of time. So, okay, yeah, I'm I'm also just done. So, okay, <clears throat> right. yeah. So, just to... thank you. Thanks. Questions or or comments? Dan, oh, you're clapping. I I have a question too, but I didn't. I want to give other people a chance to think. Uh, Matthew. Um, I had a question. So if I um, have a flow, not a map, say coming from an ODE, um, how do I, is there a good way to pick a, um, to pick a grid where I know that the transversality condition will be satisfied? Is there an automated way to do this? Mm, no, not, that's mm, not really. That's something that we mm, try to do. For some time, and it, at least we don't we don't have any good way to do that for a general for a general flow. And I, I think what we usually end up doing is trying to look at at a time tau map for the the flow, turn it into a discretized system, um, and it's not completely automated. I think that's a fair thing to say. You know, there's still a lot of tweaking mm. that has to go on because the you can have fast parts, you can have slow parts. Yeah, here, so this, yeah, this kind of thing. So if the flow is not so complicated, it's, it's um, not hard to get this done, but if you have a flow that is very fast in some direction, then it's going in other directions. Even even choosing the right tau to get a time tau map, it's not um, not easy. So if I choose a time tau map and I can compute the Conley index for the time tau map of some isolated invariant set, um, 
uh, is there a way that I can relate somehow the the shift equivalence map on homology, the discrete Conley index, back to the um, continuous Conley index that Conley himself defines, or like the homological version? Is there? Um, uh, I guess I'm not exact. Yeah, I'm a little unclear on how uh, those two gadgets relate. Mm, yeah, there are. You you can get um, really. I mean, they are related. So I don't, uh, from the top of my head, I, I would not be able to tell exactly how, but. Uh. So, so the, the, what should end up is that you end up with a shift equivalence that's equivalent to the identity map. So you really should pull off the Conley index up to shift equivalence. So you, you, you get the map, you've got the induced map on homology. If it really is coming from a flow, then what that should do is reduce its, I'm not, you're not working with a Poincaré section, you're actually working with a full phase space, then you should end up with, with so, uh, you know, the shift equivalent map will be the identity on the Conley index. I see, so, um, but then the Conley index itself will just be, uh, I guess the, the shift equivalence map becomes, uh, the shift equivalence class of the map becomes irrelevant and you're only interested in the quotient. Okay, yes. makes sense. A more transactional question: um, If you, if you're, um, you to some extent, you've put yourself in the business of uh, supporting users. You know, you've got stuff thrown up on GitHub, and you're, you know, you and you're. I wonder what your experience has been. Are you how how much support are you able to give people, and how much support would you like to be able to give people? If you know, let's assume that you wanted to proselytize and get lots of people using this, but how, how difficult a business is this to be um, not, not the Yazdi Corporation or I forgot mm. what he calls it, but mm. still trying to be in the business of supporting users. What, can you just talk a little bit about mm. that experience? Yeah, I mean, up to now it's been not so, so hard to support whichever user we, we have, but um, <clears throat> I guess if we start to get lots of more users then and especially if, if they if they need new features then that that's but i mean just just in general supporting people with um with um, with bug um, reports and this kind of things or then so far it's been okay I think. but um yeah i mean definitely we want to get more users and then uh, Does the university, would the university give you assistance to turn this into a, a, a company or you, you would have no interest in that or they would have no interest in this? If, I think if it was popular enough, then, <laughs> um, then that would be a route to try to go, yes. But I, I, we haven't been overwhelmed by, you know, um, thousands of users coming and asking us. It's usually, you know, a handful of people and, and most of them were, you know, people we've talked to who kind of get intrigued by it and then uh, we're oftentimes intrigued by why they're intrigued. So it becomes a mutual, it would be nice to be at the point where we were worrying about the- uh, Okay, yeah. I mean, you know, there, there's, some, there's some GitHub repositories that become, you know, hot potatoes and then- uh... mm, Right. Yeah, I guess somehow computational knowledge maybe. It's not gonna be one of those cases, but- <laughs> You don't, but, you don't but, know. You don't, don't know. know. It tends, <laughs> depends. Depends whether those uh, automated uh, self-driving cars, you know, that drive around on Mars, are going to need. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right, then I'm going to stop recording for the moment, or for tonight, today.